<clears throat> it says it's setting up my meeting. Miss Pittman? Is saying Miss Pittman joined? She did. She's muted. She's muted? Yeah. I may have to call. Hey, Ms. Pittman, um, Knox said he noticed you had joined us, but you're muted. You're muted. Your sound is muted. Microphone. Now, can you hear me? Mm hmm Okay. Yes, ma'am. We can see you. Perfect. I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. When I want to make it session tonight, I'll go down to stop live stream. That's what we're looking for. Right. Okay. Okay. Are we ready? I'm ready. Yes. Yeah. Everybody ready? Yes, right, sir. Let's call the meeting to order. And um, and Nate is going to do our invocation and pledge to the allegiance to the flag. Okay. Ah. Hey, heads, please. Dear our wise and everlasting God, we we'll thank you for another day. Dear Father, today is National Prayer Day. Dear Father, we pray for all the nurses and the doctors who are helping with the pandemic. Dear Father, we ask that you look over God of all the kids in this world. No matter where they may be. And Father, the decision we make in this meeting tonight will be pleased unto you. For the grace of the Lord. Amen. 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 Okay, pledge. <laughs> Congratulations. To the, the flag. flag. Of the, to the flag. United States of America. The United States of America. And to the Republic. And to the Republic. For which it stands. For which it stands. For which it stands. One nation. Under God. God. Individual. Justice for all. And justice and for all. Individual. For liberty and, and justice for all. all. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you, Nate, for that. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll have the approval of the agenda. Yes, sir. Need a motion for that, please. Make the motion to approve the agenda. Make a motion we approve. Go ahead. I'll approve it. I second. Not some motion. Okay. Okay. Very good. And everyone in favor, just say aye. We're fine. Aye. 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 Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And next, the superintendent will tell us about a lot of things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. That's okay. good. Uh, the next item. The next item under discussion. We have a special guest with us. We have Ann Hotsis, and I'm not seeing Ann any longer. She was just with us. Ann, are you still with us? Yes. I am. Can you see me now? Can you hear me? No, I we cannot. Can't see you. I can yes. hear you. Now I can see you. I can, can hear you. you. Hear? You can hear me? Oh, OK. Yes, I can see all of you. I don't. And know. so, what Anne is doing? Anne is with Cooperative Strategies, 
And this is the company we contracted with to do a district-wide enrollment projection study so that we can project how for a number of years what our actual enrollment is going to do in the system. And so Ann is actually joining us tonight from near Ohio, in Ohio. And so what might be helpful to her is if we can mute ourselves so that we can hear her presentation. So Ann, we're gonna mute ourselves. If you, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, can I share my screen? Yes, ma'am. Um, it says screen sharing is disabled. Okay, so I'm doing a new share. So, you know, okay. you sent me the presentation. Do you want me just to open mm -hmm. the presentation from my screen? Okay, sure. that's what we'll do. Sure, that works. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. All right, Ann, I think we're good. You just tell me when you want me to change the slides. All right, thank you. I hope you all are doing well tonight. Um, as Joy said, we did district-wide enrollment projections and we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so we did 10-year enrollment projections at the district-wide level by grade um, by year, and we used the cohort survival method to develop those enrollment projections. The two direct inputs of that methodology are 10 years of historical enrollment by grade by year, and then historical resident live birth counts that we get from the, Depart the State Department of Health. So that looks at the residence of the mother. In addition, we also looked at building permits, um, active and planned developments in the district and census data. So we can go to the next slide. Um, just a little bit about the methodology that we use. Um, the cohort survival method is, um, it's a widely accepted methodology to project K-12 enrollment. Um, it's used throughout the country at um, local um, school district level to federal um, agencies. So this is the methodology that we use. And what it does is basically look at the number of students that move from grade to grade, year to year, over a period of time. And what we do is we look at all of the survival ratios. That's that percentage of kids that move from grade to grade, year to year. So we look at all of those and then develop a projection ratio based on that analysis. Um, that projection ratio is applied to the enrollment and then that's how the projections are developed. Um, the kindergarten enrollment is calculated by looking at historically how many um, how many of those resident live births from five years prior to kindergarten showed up in kindergarten um, over a period of time and then applying that same methodology. Um, this methodology um, considers things like migration, housing, dropouts, transfers, charter schools, open enrollment, all of those types of things. What it doesn't do is project um, changes or significant changes into the future. So if you've had housing um, in the past, you know, in the, in the period of time that we've studied, then it factors that kind of housing moving forward. If you've never had housing in, in the years that we looked at for the projections, and then in three years, there's a big housing boom and you're seeing all kinds of housing that's never been seen before, that's something that wouldn't be factored into that method, into this methodology. Um, we have other studies that we do in, um, to look at enrollment from that perspective, but 
the methodology that we used here um, does look at it to a certain extent. What we provided um, was a range of enrollment projections, um, low, moderate, high, and a recommended. Um, again, I looked at the um, active and planned development in the area, and I know that there's concern about growth due to the battery plant that is um, being built. And so um, in anticipation for that and noticing that there's been a slight increase in building permits in the most recent years, we used um, a three-year weighted average for that moderate enrollment projection, which I'll get into a little bit more um, in a few slides. So we can go to the next slide. So this is the birth data that we were able to get from the Georgia Department of Public Health. Um, as you can see in 2003-04, in that school year, there were 76 live births, um, resident live births, which is resident of the mother. Um, and then compared to uh, the 2017-18 school year, that school year had um, 105 life births. So over that period of time, there has been, you know, pretty steady increase in the number of life births, some, some fluctuation up and down. Um, and so, like I said earlier, this data is what we use to project kindergarten five years later. Because this data only goes through 2017-18, um, that projects the kindergarten enrollment for the 2022-23 school year. To project kindergarten beyond that, we used a simple average of the last three years of live births um, to project the kindergarten enrollment through the 2029-30 school year. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so the top uh, table uh, shows the number of single family and multifamily building permits issued um, in Commerce City. So there was, you know, quite a few building permits for single family homes issued around 2001 through about 2006. And then there was a decline during that um, housing slump. And then there's been an increase starting in the, um, in 2015, there's been a pretty um, stable increase in the number of single family building permits issued. In addition, there are several um, active and planned single family developments in the district. This data is um, as of February, uh, late February of this year. So um, several uh, available units, uh, 492 based on the data that we collected at that time. Um, some of the timelines are unknown. Um, and some of them are, are set to complete in the fall of this year, um, maybe the summer of this year, and then through um, 2021 for, the, uh, for, one, for a couple of those, and then 22, 23 for Highland Estates. Um, one thing to kind of know, you know, I know a lot of districts we work with, they see that there's a lot of development going on and they're like the kids, the kids that they're gonna develop. And what we've noticed is that um, new developments, they do yield new students typically. Um, it's not typically the highest yield the, upon occupancy of that development. So it's usually about five to seven years, I would say. Um, depending on the district, it might be a little bit longer before you see the highest yield in those developments. So. Um, that being said, it's important, especially when there is development occurring in the district, that um, you keep an eye on the enrollment. And as you start to see changes in your enrollment, um, doing updates as needed. So uh, we can go on to the next slide. So the, the graph and the table on the left show Jackson County population estimates um, from 2019 to 2024. So um, as you can see here, the total population in the county is expected to increase 
approximately 8% from the 19 estimates to the 2024 estimates. Um, the school age population in the county is also expected to increase based on those estimates. Um, that increases um, approximately 10% during that same time period. The map on the right the nail of the hand. slide, um, the red, this is, sure. Yes. And I'm sorry, I just had a quick question. Those increases, that's for the entire sure. county. That's not just commerce. Yes, on the table, the table and the graph. Correct. Mm -hmm. And so the map on the right, so the data that we used um, to show that we're showing here is available by block groups. And so the block groups um, fit nicely with the county boundary, but they don't typically fit nicely with the city boundary or with the school district boundary. So what you see on the right are those block groups and we're showing um, the estimated uh, school age population change from those 2019 to the 2024 estimates. The areas with the dark red are those block groups that are expected to have the higher increase in school age population change. And then the areas in the dark blue have the, um, the most decline in school age population change. Um, so the areas to sort of the east and the, the south of the district, the south portion of the district and the east side of the district, that's the area that based on those estimates are expected um, to grow the most over the next five years. We can go to the next slide. So this is the historical enrollment for the district. And um, over the last 10 years, it's increased um, 278 students. And the current enrollment, including pre-K, is 1,713 based on the 2019-20 enrollment. One thing I want to point out on this slide is um, that cohort survival method. So you'll see some of this dark blue, um, particularly in the early years. Um, let's look at the 2010-11 school year grade three. And then, so that's 92 kids. And then you can kind of follow that as like a diagonal to the right um, and then down. So the next year, that cohort, that 92 third graders um, is 89 in fourth grade the next year. 103 the following year and so on. Um, so my guess is that that was a very small kindergarten class. We don't have the data going back, um, but based on this methodology, you can kind of see the cohorts moving through as these dark, darker bands of blue and then some lighter bands. So if you look at the kindergarten enrollment um, in 2017-18, for example, you can see that that has increase that's about 130 kindergartners. And then in first grade in the 18-19 school year, that's 135 and then 121. So you kind of start to see that pinkish um, kind of color moving through. The kindergarten enrollment for the current school year is 150. So that is um, a lot higher than it's been in this 10 year period of time. And um, so when we look at the projections, you'll, you'll be able to see that kindergarten class will be in first grade in the first year of the projection. So we can go on to the next slide. Um, so we, like I said earlier, we developed a recommended low, moderate and high uh, projection to provide a range. Um, the moderate, so the low, moderate and higher are basically pure math. So it's looking at those two direct inputs, which is the resident life birth data and the historical enrollment, looking at the survival ratios and based on um, some calculations, the moderate, low and high enrollment projections were developed. The moderate projection was based on a three-year weighted average of the survival ratios by grade. And so the low and the high were developed based on that. 
Uh, the recommended, what we do is we look at every survival ratio for every grade and every year and try to see if we can see some trends that, um, or some anomalies that may impact what we may have seen in the moderate. So, um, so on the next slide, you'll see a graph that shows all four projections together. And our recommended projection is a little bit higher than the moderate, um, but lower than the high. And that's likely due to some of that development that's been occurring in the, in the past few years, along with some movement into the district based on some development that's occurring. So on to the next slide. So, Anne, do you want me to go to the next one? Or oh, do you yeah, want to talk I'm about sorry. This? I thought, yes. <laughs> sorry, I must have broken up there. Yes, the next slide, please. Okay. Um, okay, so this is the recommended projection. And um, if we look at the kindergarten again, you can see that kindergarten for the coming school year, the 2021 school year is a little, is in line with where it was this year. Um, this year's was 150 and um, next year's kindergarten is projected to be about 146. Looking at first grade, you'll see that that's 154 and then you can kind of see those darker um, or pink bands moving through. So those are those larger class sizes. Um, when we start to see growth in the current elementary level, it will naturally move into the other grade band. So you'll see that, um, for example, the five to eight grade configuration, that's gonna see some growth as well as the nine twelve um, throughout the 10 years of the projections. Uh, so that that's, you know, all part of that cohort model. Um, you can see it through the historical and then you can see it through the projected. Um, going on to the next slide, please. So when we're doing enrollment projections, we um, offer this service to all of our clients. The most important thing that I can recommend is that districts monitor their enrollment and how they compare to their, their projections that they're using for planning purposes. So as things happen, um, they can impact the enrollment. So for example, um, we've worked in districts that have had annexation. So they've had a lot of growth because they've annexed land. They don't necessarily have a timeline in terms of when that land is going to be annexed and the impact of that in the future. Changes in policies impact enrollment. Um, I've worked in districts where they've added full day kindergarten. They used to have half day kindergarten. They've added full day kindergarten. And so it impacts that kindergarten enrollment. And then um, subsequently it will impact first grade enrollment. So things like that um, is something that we can't necessarily anticipate if it hasn't already happened, but keeping an eye on it uh, can prompt an update and then um, as you con continue to monitor and update projections, you'll always have good planning numbers to use. Um, so some of those things that can, can impact it is changes in birth trends. So when people move into districts and then there's more population, there tends to be um, increases in that resident life birth count. Also um, housing can impact it. So if that housing, uh, trend were to change, increase or decrease, then that may impact enrollment projections. If it stays the same, it would likely um, not have as much impact. It's that change in what has happened historically or in the recent past that has the most impact. Um, things like planned but not built housing. So we've got um, planned housing that is in line with what we've started to see in the last several years. If housing came to a halt, that could impact enrollment. 
So those are just things to kind of keep an eye on. And when we, um, in the fall, if you want to send me your enrollment for the fall by grade, then I can do that for you and let you know kind of how it shakes out. And if I would recommend doing an update at that time or just keeping an eye on it. The range is um, provided so that if things change and you can't necessarily do an update for whatever reason, you have some tools in your pocket. So if the housing slowed down, for example, then you may want to keep an eye on that low projection or the moderate projection since that's a little bit lower than what we projected um, as the recommended. The high projection would be I would recommend looking at that if housing increased um, at a higher rate than what you've been seeing. Um, so those are just some tools for you to kind of keep in your back pocket um, as you're monitoring enrollment. Um, I think that covers everything that I wanted to touch on. And then, um, so if anyone has any questions, I have the report with me as well. Um, you know, if you have any questions regarding any of the things that I presented or um, anything that's in the report, I'm happy to answer questions. Any questions from anyone? Oh. And this was helpful to me just to see kind of what to expect over the next few years. And, and we had always kind of done this on our own, but the part that we didn't have would have been the live birth data. And so that was a tremendous help. That was good. Oh, good. Good. And at the beginning of your Any questions you for Ann? Uh, at the beginning of the presentation, you kind of said that this method that y'all use did not necessarily factor in uh, some of the the growth that we are we know is coming from the from the battery plant. Is that accurate? But then towards the end, it seemed like you were so <laughs> y'all kind of did factor that in. No, we did we did factor it in um, when. The, when it opens and people move into the district, then that is something that we're going to have to really keep an eye on what, you know, whether it's us doing that comparison of the actual to projected enrollment. And, you know, we, we do that for districts and we'll say, okay, it looks like trends are starting to shift. So when that plant opens and people move in, it's going to be hard to necessarily know how many of those employees are going to have kids, where they're going to live, if they're going to live within the district, if they're going to live with, you know, outside of the district. But um, we did factor in uh, these building permits that have been issued and the fact that there is development and growth. So when we're looking at those survival ratios, uh, which are in the report, uh, I think they're on page, um, page, Page 16 of the report, um, looking at those survival ratios, we can start to see some increases in those numbers. So survival ratios that are greater than 100 show growth, 100, greater than 100% show growth. And um, so we start to see that in the more recent years. So that's why we decided um, to use that three-year weighted average of survival ratios because we thought that factored in fairly um, what we what we what we felt was going to continue to happen based on the growth. So if there were some anomalies, um, like grades four to five, for example, um, looking at, uh, actually, that's not really a great example. The one to two is a good example. So um, the current survival ratio is 89.63%, which is significantly lower than what we saw in the previous years. That three-year weighted average was 91 because that 89 was weighted more heavily. So in the recommended projection, that's a number that I probably used 
um, something more in line with what you had seen in the previous years, thinking that that 89% is likely an anomaly, given the fact that there's um, development in the area and things like that. So, um, so yes, it was, but being able to sort of predict, you know, how many people will move into the district exactly and how many of those kids will be there and, and all of that, that's something that um, as people move in, that will change your enrollment, that will change these numbers um, and new projection ratios would get developed to apply. Uh, so, so yes, yes and no, there isn't a magic formula for, you know, plants or industries that are opening um, businesses in areas and there isn't really a multiplier. We've had a lot of districts that have had new businesses come in and um, the people that work there didn't have children or they live just outside the district for various reasons or some areas their enrollment increased higher than what they expected because of um, industry that opened in in school districts near theirs but not necessarily in there so it's really just something that I would recommend keeping a close eye on and updating as needed. So in and one app see... open, this is the actual report. This is separate, but you have a copy of this to take a look at. I did see that um, there is a, a second phase to the battery plant that is being built um, that will open, I think it was a year later than the phase one. Um, so that will definitely be something you want to kind of keep a close eye on for the next several years as people move in, as those plants open, as they start hiring more people and things like that. So it's definitely something I would keep your eye on um, for the next several years. Any other questions while we have Anne with us? All right, Miss Ann, this was great. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. All right. All right, now we're ready to review the regular board meeting for Monday night. So I'll switch over to that agenda. And we'll have the usual part, call to order, invocation and pledge, public participation, approval of agenda. And then I've asked the principals to join us on Monday night just to give you an update as to how we're going to close out the school year for each of the schools. And Mr. Smith will be talking to you about graduation plans. I can tell you that one of the things we've discussed since we knew all of this was happening is doing our best to do a traditional ceremony. And I had a chance to talk to the governor's staff this week and just find out from their point of view, we're in phase one. So how would they feel if our 88 graduates, because it's a small graduating class, if they were to graduate in the stadium that can accommodate 4,000 people, and we can space the graduates on the field six feet apart, and we can give each graduate approximately five tickets, just like we would if we were having it inside because of a rain day in the gym, and then the graduates can bring five of their family members into the stadium and we will seat them six feet apart. And so the governor's staff said that they are perfectly fine with us proceeding with that plan. They did recommend two things. They recommended that we have law enforcement present 
just to enforce the six feet apart uh, for the spectators and that we limit the amount of people who are actually on the field with the graduates. And so what we've discussed is that we would have the people who would be speaking at graduation, they will actually be seated on the field with the graduates. So that's really the plan for now. Um, we had talked to them about prom, but the governor's staff had said, as long as we are still in phase one, a prom is not permitted because you can't keep the six feet of social distance. And so they said that it would be allowed once Georgia moves into phase two of the three phases, but he could not assure me, of course, that we will move into phase two by mid-June. And so we have canceled the prom for the high school and we are in the process of giving refunds to the students who have already bought their prom tickets. Now today, I also checked with Brian Bullock, who is um, our local 911 person, just to see if he had any concerns about our plan. And, and he absolutely did not. He thought it was a great idea. Um, he did encourage me to check with a person at the health department. And so I've contacted that person, but I did not get a response. So I will be calling them again tomorrow just to verify that everybody's okay with it. And um, I had just told the governor's office, you know, graduation is just such a special event. And I didn't want anyone to think that we were trying to do something that would be against the governor's guidelines. And and so they assured us that they would be perfectly okay with that plan. Um, we just have to make sure that we follow through and do the things that we've assured them that we would do. I did um, speak with Mr. Smith and I told him that, you know, we could go one step further and require that the people coming into graduation also wear a mask just to provide an extra layer of protection for those people. Yeah, that's a real good idea. The masks are very important mm -hmm. to not spreading this thing. Right. But one of the things that we've run into um, when we try to order masks or check on the availability of masks, they don't necessarily want any entity to order a large number of masks because it puts a burden on the health field. And so what we've discussed is if you're coming to graduation and you received a ticket to attend graduation, then you would also be responsible for providing your own mask. Yeah, that ought to work. At the office, we're having everybody wear one and almost all of them find one to wear. Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. that's this time of year. There'll right. be more and more. Right. Dr. Tobel, yeah. will we be able to live stream that graduation? And that was, that was another thing that um, the governor's staff had recommended is that we would do face, they just suggested Facebook Live so that the family members who do not receive tickets would still be able to attend and see the ceremony. And um, we definitely can do that because we have all of the filming equipment to make that happen. If we have to be in the gym because of the weather, there's there's not enough. There are not we enough six, six not feet that. apart. I'm sorry. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. We will not go inside the gym. It would only be open in the stadium. Would it just be canceled if it were to be raining or? Yes, ma'am. We would postpone oh, for a different day. It? Mm -hmm. That'd be terrible, maybe. <clears throat> well, what we've done in the past, we do uh, um, either Friday night or Saturday morning. And so that Saturday morning is normally our follow-up rain date. Other questions or any concerns about that plan? Are we going to be wearing masks and sitting six feet apart? 
Well, actually, and I can leave that up to y'all, but we just said in an effort to limit the people who would be on the field, the only people traditionally, as you know, we would have the Board of Education on the field and we would have the faculty on the field and we would have the city council on the field. And so just to be in line with the guidance they had given us, the only people who would be on the football field with the seniors would be the people who have a speaking part at graduation. So the board would not be on the field with the kids. Good. That sounds fine to me. Okay. Um, and then we'll have all the principals here on Monday night just to share, not here, but we'll have them um, join us on Monday night just to share an update about closing out the school year. Okay. All right, let's go to item B. It's the April 2020 financial reports. If you look at revenue, revenue is still coming in. And so that puts us at 88% um, that we've received of what we projected of the total budget for FY20. And so right now we've received 14719688 of the projected $16 million that we were hoping for. So a year ago this time, we were at 87% for revenue. So we're a little bit above where we were a year ago. For expenses, we're at 80% of what we had projected. Um, we had projected by this time of the year, we would be um, closer because the total budget is 17 million for expenses. And so currently we closed out April with 13,695,623 in expenses. And so a year ago, um, for expenses, we were just over 84% for expenses. And so, you know, not being in school, um, we have noticed a savings as far as the expenses. Some things we are still spending because we have those funds available. Um, and so we had the purchase orders that had already been completed. And so we are processing those purchase orders. Uh, an example would be with the um, utilities. Just this mm -hmm. past month, we had saved $15,000 in utilities in wow. one month. Um, so, so we are seeing some savings. Yeah. On the balance sheet, as of the end of April, April 30th, in the fund balance, we were at $3,293,030.19. That fund balance is actually up about $694,000 from where we were a year ago in the fund balance. So if the economy had to go south, um, I am pleased with where we are right now. Um, I don't know that there's ever a magical figure that you want to have, but I would say that um, we are in a better place, much better place going into the economic decline than what we were the last time. Any questions about revenue or expenses or the balance sheet? Whitney will join us on Monday to go over those with you. Item C, I've posted the board minutes from April, so you're welcome to take a look at those before Monday night. And item D, some of you have probably 
Um, you've seen the messages I've shared with you from the state. We knew this was coming. We just didn't know what it was going to be like. And now we have a little bit better idea, but um, we are still getting daily updates from the state. And so I just wanted to go over some of the information we've learned about next year's budget cuts. One of the things that they're telling us is that we will face a 14% cut in our state funds. Oh. And so that number for us on the budget is an overall $1,816,556 at a minimum. So oh. that's the amount that if the state were to call and say, okay, you've got to cut 14% of your budget, then Commerce is looking at 1.8 million that has to be found in the budget to cut. So we will receive the CARES funds, that's the federal relief funds. Um, our system is receiving $295,112. So that's going to lessen our shortfall to $1,521,444. So one of the things Whitney and I have been spending a tremendous amount of time doing is we have gone through every single expenditure. We've worked with the principals to look at every single position in the system and we have identified areas where we can cut um, and we can get some savings. Some of the areas that we're looking at, um, obviously to eliminate 1.5 million from the budget, you're going to have to look at all of our current expenditures, which we're doing. I will tell you that cuts will be made to personnel. I don't have definites yet but I can tell you that we're going to have to do that. When 85% of our overall budget is personnel and you, you're told that you've got to find at least 1.5 million, then you know you're going to have to cut personnel. Are you going to furlough any, have you? Well, what will happen? That? Would that help? One of the things that they've cautioned us against, Ms. Pittman, is actually, um, using the term furlough. And so you'll hear me talk about salary reductions through a reduced calendar. And it, it's just the only difference is what the system actually saves in what we spend on the teacher retirement payments. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the things that we are looking at, I was in a um, call today with the superintendents in the Northeast Georgia RESA area and really majority of the systems, there are 14 systems in our RESA and majority of those systems are all looking at a reduced calendar for FY21. One of the things, because the governor's office has asked for input from the superintendents across the state. And one of the things that we've asked for, when we went through this before, then from the state, they had mandated the number of days, furlough days. And so what we're asking for is that they do that once again, because when you, when you don't do that, then you have some of the systems that have much larger fund reserves than what we have, then they can take the hit to their budget better than we can without having to yeah. furlough their employees. And so if you're in a system like us and we have a smaller local supplement and on top of that, you're furloughing your employees, then it's like a double hit for yeah. our employees. And so I just feel like to make things a little more equal, it would be more fair if all school systems in the state basically were told by the state to do the same thing. Right. I don't know that that will happen. Um, the thinking there is that it's an election year. Mm -hmm. And so just to be perfectly honest, I don't know that that's something that elected officials are going to want to come out and do in an election year, but it would definitely um, 
sort of be an equalizer across the state for school systems. Other areas that we're looking at um, to find potential cuts would be in professional learning. I've asked the principals that we only do essential professional learning. We will avoid all overnight expenses and limit the travel expenses. And we will only attend and send teachers to the professional learning that is required mm -hmm. for us to attend. Supply money for FY21 will be restricted to needs and not wants. Um, that we will do that a little bit differently than what we did this year. Um, this year, each school had a budget and they were allowed to build their budgets and spend their budgets um, the way they needed to. And we're going to revert back to a way that we did it similar when we went through this before and we will not be sending school budgets to the schools. And so if the schools have a need, they'll just request that, uh, make their request, and then we will decide, is that truly a need or is that a want? And, um, and we will deal with that the same way we did years ago. Field trips, we're asking principals to please limit the number of trips that require buses, fuel, and bus drivers. Computer software and hardware. Um, Mona and Toby have been working with our software vendors because a lot of the vendors right now understand the bind that school systems are in and they're willing to work with us. And if, since our budgets are being cut 14, 15%, then what we're asking our software vendors to do is to cut their quotes and cut their prices by an equal amount just to help us through this time. We're also looking at our maintenance requests. Um, you can look back at our budget and, and one of our biggest expenditures is just maintaining the facilities. Um, really our two oldest facilities, primary and not so much elementary actually is um, middle and primary. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that um, Whitney and I met with Jason Martin this week and we discussed um, he will actually be given a maintenance budget and then what we're going to do is ask Jason to prioritize those requests, those maintenance requests, and he will know how much money he has to work with for the year and then he will make a judgment call. Is this something that I need that needs immediate attention or is this something that I can put on the back burner and when I see that we have money available, then we can have that expenditure. So those are just a few things that um, we know that we need to do. And um, I'll talk to you tonight in executive session about some of the personnel things that um, we've talked about. Honestly, we've um, when I say we have looked at every single position in this system, we have. And um, when we felt like we could make a change, then um, those are some of the changes that I'll be talking to you about. Any questions about the business items? We've got some. Yeah, dealing with the, the te teachers. What is We've that? got teachers in, in, in this. We will have to downsize. I said, will we have to downsize the classrooms? Some F by 21, you think? Well, you know, that that's a good question because um, there are two schools of thought on that because all of you know that the one thing that um, the way schools are funded, you're funded based on the number of students you have. And so an example of that would be right now, if you all were to ask me, Joy, how many kindergarten registration just opened on May the 5th? this week, two days ago. And so that's the first time anyone could go online and register their kindergarten student. So right now, because what we're doing is we're accepting all Commerce City students first and all out of district students are on a waiting list. So right now we have 27, now we've been doing this two days, 
We have 27 mm -hmm. out of district students on a waiting list mm -hmm. to come to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So what if, one of the things we have to do is wait, of course, and see how many Commerce City students we have. Mm -hmm. Well, we know you're going to have 75 or somewhere around the, the number of 75 because our pre-K roll up to kindergarten. So the, the trick to that, Nathan, to answer your question is, yes, would we want to go ahead and try to um, take as many of those out of district students as possible so that we're um, earning FTE funds on those students? The, at the same time, we're also told if we go back face-to-face -face instruction in the fall that we're going to have to follow certain CDC guidelines as far as spacing students apart. And, and so that's where you're kind of, you have the dilemma, you know, yes, we do want to try to allow as many of those students to come to our school system as we can, but then you have the unknown that if students have to be spaced far apart, then we're going to have to get into, because no classroom is large enough in any school system um, to accommodate children sitting six feet apart. Um, because, you know, you have certain square footage requirements in every Georgia classroom. And so they're not built so students are spaced six feet apart. And so we're going to have to if that does happen, then we would have to look at alternate plans as far as um, a morning afternoon session or A B sessions, and, and those are just other things that we're going to have to consider. I heard Did that answer your question, Nathan. Thank you. I had heard of yes. a system that's that. I guess they were saving money is what they were doing, but they they cut the number of days that they would be in school. They start would start after Labor Day and then they would get out in early May. I didn't know you could do that. I thought you had to have 180 days, but maybe they're changing the rule. No, maybe Right. And in fact, because we are a charter system, then we have some flexibility as far as our instructional time. And um, it, obviously, because they missed so much face to face this year, we would like to get as school days as possible here. And um, that's not really something that we want to do. We're basically optimistic enough to hope that we'll be able to start school um, as planned in July, but we'll just have to wait and see. Are we still held to the um, other questions rule about tests? About that? Are we not having, are we not giving any tests or was that just well, in fact, one time? For this year, um, as you know, we're not required to give the state test. Uh -huh. And so what we're asking the state to do is grant an additional testing waiver for FY21 uh -huh. and to relieve us of the accountability requirement for testing in FY21. And so that's one of the things we've discussed that if school systems if the state would go ahead and tell school systems now that we've waived the state testing for next year, then that would that would allow us to have a little more flexibility mm -hmm. as far as how we schedule our instructional days. Absolutely. And, um, and, and I, I don't think that that's too far away in the near future, Ms. Bittman, to be honest with you. So I've completed two surveys recently, one being today from the state just asking our opinion about how we feel about waiving the state test next year. And on both of those surveys, my 
my preference is to waive the test for FY21. Well, it would certainly give more time to try to make up some of all the days they've lost, you know, without having to to work on testing. Sure, without because having... you're not, you're not. Yes, ma'am. You're exactly right. Instead of that testing time, that could be instructional time. The other thing that I'm sure that's weighing on the state's minds, testing is terribly expensive for our state. Yes. And in a year when there's not enough money in budget, it would be a huge savings for the yes. state to waive that state assessment. So I'm sure that's gonna play a part, I would guess. Okay. Thank you. All right, going yes, back to Monday night's agenda, we'll have the consent agenda, and then we'll move into the superintendent's report. The school financials are posted, so you can take a look at those before Monday night. Okay. ELOS report, you might want to take a picture of this with your phones, because you may not see an ELOS balance like this in a while. <laughs> On the 1st of April, we brought forward a balance of 2,428,471.37. We had a withdrawal of 47,874.85. The purpose of the withdrawal was 29,400 of that went for iPads. 3,897 of that went for a charging cart and 14,577.85 paid for the steamer at the middle school. So then at the end of April, April 29th, we had a deposit of 140,554.27 with a little bit of interest at the end of April, 1,581.66 for an ending balance of 2,522,000. 532.45. Good. That's great. Mm. So that will help us just knowing that balance is there will help us as we have to make the outstanding bond payments and the, the principal and interest payments on the bond and the bus lease and the ABM payment. Mm. Uh, executive session, unless something changes, I don't see a need to go into executive session Monday night. And then we have the personnel items that we'll go over and then we will adjourn. Any questions about Monday night's agenda? No. How long do you think, okay. think so. How long do you think we're gonna be doing it this way? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I would be hopeful that maybe by June that we'll be able to have a normal board meeting. You know, I, yeah. I just. Yeah. Are you want to wait for phase two? Sir? You want to wait for phase two? Ain't phase uh, well, two phase in June? Two, mm -hmm. well, phase two, what they're telling us will be June 12th or June 13th, somewhere in mid June. For phase two. Mm -hmm. And we can do that. That's completely up to y'all, whatever you decide. I'm good with it. Okay, next we will need to go into executive session to discuss personnel. And so what I'm going to do when we go into executive session, then that's when I'll remove us from the YouTube live stream. Would anyone make a motion that we go into executive session? I make a motion we go into executive session to discuss personnel. I second. And second. I second, Dr. Sergeant. And all in favor? I... Yay. Thank... Very good, Mary. Aye. Very good. And all in favor would be aye. 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 Okay. Anybody opposed? Nope. 